is the season to talk amino acids. Fa la 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 alanine. So alanine is the second amino acid we're going to talk about in 20 days of amino acids. Amino acids are protein letters, among other things. So there are 20 common amino acids that are genetically encoded. So basically our genes ha can pass the recipe on to the protein making machinery through like a messenger RNA or mRNA copy. Um, so in there, there's the instructions for putting in these various amino acids. And so there's 20 of these. And the one we're going to talk about today is alanine. So um, just a quick refresher. So amino acids have a carboxyl group and an amino group. They link together through by joining these groups through peptide bonds. And when they do that, only their unique part. So the generic part is the amine group and the carboxyl group that lets them link up. And then they have these unique parts. So these R chain, these R groups are these side chains that stick out and they have different properties. So they give the protein different properties and influence how it folds, how it interacts with other things, etc. So yesterday we talked about glycine and glycine was the smallest amino acid and it's R group. Like literally this was just a hydrogen. So it just had two hydrogens on this carbon. With alanine, we have a methyl group. So we have this CH3. This is going to have some important consequences. So we talked about how you might think like glycine would be super generic because it's just the hydrogen. It's got like the simplest thing you could have for a side chain. So you would think it might be generic, right? No, because that it was so small, it made this protein really loosey goosey because you're not having restricted motion from the side chain kind of like hitting into things when they link up. So when you, with alanine, you have this CH3 group, so it's more like normal in terms of amino acids. So alanine is kind of like the generic amino acid in, if you want to, like, I guess, like most generic. Um, so sometimes we'll even, when we're doing like site-directed mutagenesis, so if we want to see what a certain amino acid does, maybe we have a hint that it might be doing something based on like a structure, a crystal structure or something, we can change it to an alanine to see if they, um, if the effects goes away or if there's things that are different because alanine is pretty like blah so basically the ch3 group is what we call it's a non-polar group um so basically all of these atoms are linked up by sharing pairs of electrons they don't always share fairly and so if they don't share fairly so the electrons are ne the negatively charged parts and so atoms are made up of protons which are positively charged um, neutrons, which are neutral, and electrons, which are negatively charged. The protons are what, like the number of protons defines an element, and the protons are held tight in the central nucleus, and then the electrons are swirling, are like whizzing around them. And these electrons are negatively charged, the protons are positively charged. So the protons are kind of like helping rein in the electrons, but if those electrons are really far away, it's hard to rein them in. Um, and so the ones on the outside, like the valence electrons, they can kind of move around more and elect atoms can actually like share pairs of them, kind of like merge together parts of their electron clouds. Um, but they don't always share fairly. And so when they don't share fairly, you can have this imbalance of charge where one of the atoms, the electrons are hanging out near it more. And so that's going to be partly negative. And then the other part is going to be like the, ad the electrons aren't hanging out with it as much. So it's going to be partly positive. And this is generates what we call polarity, where you have this kind of like separation of polar charge of charges, which we see a ton in water because the oxygen is really electronegative. So it's really good at pulling those electrons. So it's going to be partly negative and the other parts are partly positive. And so water is really polar and those opposite charge are specific partial charges attract. And so water really likes to hang out with other water molecules um, as well as hang out with um, other things that have partial charges or full charges. And so we call those things that water likes to hang out with hydrophilic. Whereas things that are really boring for the water, so things that don't have, things that are nonpolar that don't have that property, um, those are, would be like hydrophobic um, because the water can't really hang out with it. So it kind of like clinches around it um, and kind of forces all those hydrophobic parts together, minimizing their contact with the water and the amount of water that needs to be like sidetracked by trying to like deal with all this hydrophobic stuff. So alanine is one of these hydrophobic amino acids. Um, and so it's, well, it's an aliphatic amino acid. So basically that just means that it has a like a hydrocarbon chain, so hydrogen and carbon. And it's not in this like aromatic ring like some of them will look at. Um, so it is nonpolar. Um, so this is going to make and um, it's like hydrophobic but not as much as some other ones will look at um because it's not like it's just like a short little chain like if it had a longer hydrophobic tail or that sort of thing it would be more hydrophobic but because it has this nonpolar quality um then it's often found like in the center of proteins and stuff it's often really often found in alpha helices which are like the 
if you're looking at one of those like structural models of a protein, one of those like helices, um, those curly, curly Q ribbon things. Um, yeah, so alanine really likes to be in those. It's really good at being in those because it's not too big and stuff. And so it can kind of fit nicely. Um, so when you have like the amino acids joined together to form a peptide, the peptide or to form like, yeah, a peptide and then you add more and you have like a polypeptide that folds up and you call it a protein. Um, so when these link up, the as we talked about more in previous posts, the bond that you have, the peptide bond between them is going to be, it's going to be like stuck in a plane. And so you can only have rotation around the turns and around like on either side. So the peptide bond is what we call resonance stabilized. And so that means the electrons are kind of being shared through the carbonyl carbon, the nitrogen and the, um, the oxygen. And so you kind of have double bonded character throughout. And to maintain that resonance, you can't like twist around a double bond. So you can't twist there, but you can twist on either side of that. So we call these like the phi and the psi angles. Um, and we can plot where they're most likely to be in that sort of thing. Um, and so alanine is really good at being in the like those angles where the alpha helices like to be. Um, its side chain doesn't interfere with that too much or anything. Um, so it's really good for that. So the side chain, as we talked about, it's like the second smallest. Um, so, and because basically if you add a carbon, you have to add hydrogens because carbons come, basically hydrogens are kind of like filler space when it comes to organic molecules. So organic molecules are like molecules that are based on hydrogen and carbon. Um, and so carbon can bond, to, can form up to four bonds and it like always forms um, up to four bonds. So that could be like three single bonds uh, or four single bonds or one sing two, a double bond and like two single bonds or whatever, but it needs to be like full. Um, and so you basically just stick on hydrogens to get there. So when you add a carbon, you're gonna add this, the three hydrogens. So CH3, and we call this a methyl group. So a consequence of having this is that unlike glycine, but like all the other amino acids, this is going to make alanine chiral because this carbon, this alpha carbon, so the carbon that's attached to the, um, like the amine group and the carboxyl group, and the, the one that has the side chain sticking off, this is going to be chiral because it has four different things attached to it. So remember, carbon can form up to four bonds. And when it form, when you have a carbon that forms bonds to four different things, we call that a chiral center. Okay. So these might look like they're the same. They're basically, they're mirror images of one another. But if I flip this over, you can see that the connectivity is different at this alpha carbon. So this, I could have this attached, this, um, this hydrogen, so this carbon, remember it's bonded to four things. So the hydrogen, it can be sticking forward or it can be like sticking back. And then this can be sticking forward or sticking back. But I can't interconvert between the two without like pulling these off and switching their places. And so we call these um, stereoisomers um, because they have different 3D arrangements in space. And so all of the stereoisomers of amino acids that we typically talk about, the ones that are found in our proteins and stuff, are the L stereoisomer. Um, and so if you take like OCHEM and stuff, you might see like R and S configurations and stuff, which is like the like the real way of determining stereo centers. Um, but we use this L and D notation that's based on like similarity to sugars conformation and stuff. But basically you just have to remember that most of the time R's are going to be L um, or basically like all the time. There's an instance that we'll look at where bacteria actually use D-alanine, um, a couple of D-alanines, um, so this weirdo, um, to build their walls their strength in their cell walls. And then antibiotics we use, um, like the beta-lactam antibiotics, like penicillin and stuff, they can kind of mimic the diala diala that the bacteria use. And then, so the bacteria try to use it and then they get stuck on this uh, antibiotic and um, that's how this work. Um, yeah, so basically though, this has this consequence where alanine is the smallest chiral amino acid. So the other amino acids we're going to look at will be chiral as well. Um, everything except for glycine, uh, because glycine has two hydrogens, so it's not attached to four different things. You need four different things to be a chiral center. And so alanine is going to be our first um, chiral amino acid that we are going to look at. And so there's a lot of other cool stuff about alanine, um, such as it is going to help our muscles and our liver 
um, like nutrient help our muscles when they break down, like when they break down proteins and they're producing this, like these amino acids with this like nitrogen that they need to get rid of without having this like dangerous ammonia building up. Um, and they want to like ship that to the liver and the muscles are also breaking down sugar. And so they have these sugar breakdown products and then they want more sugar without just like wasting all their energy breaking down the sugar. Um, so basically they can send their waste products to the liver in the form of alanine. So basically they take the um, amino group from a amino acid they don't want. They stick it on to pyruvate, which is um, an end product, of, like an intermediate of, or it's like an end product of glycolysis. But then instead of going into that, like the oxidative, the citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, all of that, instead they can just stick an amino group from an amino acid or onto it to form alanine, ship that to the liver. Then the liver can get rid of the amino group and through the urea cycle. And then they can actually, um, to when they take the amino group back off, now you're left back with pyruvate, which in the liver can then go through gluconeogenesis to make glucose, which can then get sent to your muscles. And so your muscles, hey, we got more glucose and we got rid of that nitrogen. And so you have this glucose alanine um, cycle. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, so let's look at more detail about alanine. Um, so all about alanine today. A2 of 20 days of amino acids and we are at alanine. Um, so this is alanine. Um, it's nickname, aka it's three letter initial is ALA and it's an initial is A. So it's three letter code is ALA, it's initial is A, it's full name is alanine. So this is one of the easier ones to remember and recognize um, based on its name alone, as opposed to some of them um, which have like weird initials and stuff. Um, so yes, so its side chain is this methyl group. Um, it's coded for by the um, codon starting with GC. So GCU, GCC, GCA, and GCG. Um, so it's got this box covered. Um, so yesterday we looked at glycine, today we looked at alanine. And so remember that this, the codon is what's going to be the sequence um, in, the, in the messenger RNA. So the recipe basically, um, it's going to correspond to this tRNA is going to take the corresponding amino acid um, and bring it. And so it reads these in these three letter words called codons, these RNA letters. Um, so three RNA letters spell one protein letter. Um, and then it goes to the next three letters and the next three letters and the next three letters. And so every time it comes across a um, GCU, GCC, GCA, or GCG, a tRNA attached to alanine will come and bring the alanine. And then those will get connected together um, through a peptide bond with the help of this ribosome on um, the site like protein RNA complex. Um, so pretty cool stuff. Um, and more on that in the translation video. Um, okay, so molecular weight, 89.094 grams per mole. Um, that's, yeah, and then we, so we talked about it's pretty generic and boring property wise, um, but that doesn't mean that it is not interesting or important. Um, and so it is a not, we call it non, it's classified as non-essential, um, uh, but in the dietary sense, that just means that we can make it ourselves. Like we don't need to have it made like pre-made it. We don't need to get it pre-made in our food. Um, and so you can see that alanine can be made um, from pyruvate. Um, and so pyruvate is a breakdown product from glycolysis. Um, and so glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose or blood sugar. Um, and so glycolysis breaks off, breaks down this glucose, so the sugar molecule, through all these different steps um, and gives you pyruvate as the end product. And then this pyruvate um, can go through cellular in cellular respiration. This pyruvate can then um, enter the get oxidized and enter the citric acid cycle, um, and then that gives you a lot of these electron um, carriers, NADH and FADH2, that can then go on through oxidative phosphorylation, and this is where you get the big energy yields. Um, so this is with cellular respir respiration, basically your goal is to get to all, as much ATP, so as much like energy currency as you can. Um, and so this involves a lot of like electron transfers and stuff, um, which I'm not going to go into here, but basically you just 
just know that pyruvate is one of the things that you get. It's the end product of glycolysis. Um, and there are also all of these other like intermediate things. Um, and there are even more um, intermediates when we're talking about things in the citric acid cycle. And one of the things we'll come across again and again um, when we're talking about amino acids and the various um, uses is that they can, and interconversion. So basically you can make, um, a lot of the amino acids can be used, can be converted like into products from like the TCA. So the citric acid cycle, um, they can be made into like converted into products that can enter into the cycle and that could be used to make glucose. Um, and we call some products that can be made to make like ketone bodies and lipids, we call this ketogenic. And so, um, alanine is going to be glucogenic. Um, so basically we can convert it into this pyruvate and then that pyruvate can enter the triboxylic acid cycle um, and be used to make glucose or it can be used to make these other intermediates. Um, so you can take intermediates out of this pathway and use them for other things. And so one that we'll see a lot is this um, alpha ketoglutarate. Um, and so alpha ketoglutarate is going to come into play when we're talking about that um, glucose alanine cycle. So here's this alkyl ketoglutarate. And if you look at it, you can see that it basically looks like glutamate, which is another one of the amino acids. Um, so it looks like glutamate, except instead of having this amino group, it has this um, ketone group. So a ketone is where you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen um, with like non-hydrogens on either side, so with like carbons on either side. Um, and so this is an alpha ketoglutarate and this is an alpha amino acid. So basically what happens in this glucose alanine cycle is that in, the, um, so you end up with pyruvate from glycolysis. Then there's this um, alanine transferase um, enzyme. Just take this pyruvate and you take this glutamate. You can then transfer the amino group from the glutamate onto the pyruvate to make alanine. So when you do this, so you're left with this alpha ketoglutarate, which as we saw was one of those components of that TCA cycle. And so now what this alpha ketoglutarate can do is it can actually, it can stay in the muscles and it can actually take, like get remade into glutamate um, through like transamination. So you can actually, so you can take alpha ketoglutarate and you can take any free amino acid and then transfer the amine group from that amino acid onto the alpha ketoglutarate and that'll give you glutamate. Um, and so this is what we're talking about. This is that glutamate. And so this glutamate, it can come from having an amine group transferred from any amino acid. So this allows your muscles to kind of get safely move nitrogen from your muscles. So when you're breaking down like protein, your muscles are breaking down proteins and stuff. Um, you don't want all of those nitrogen groups to build up and like cause problems. Um, so these nitrogen groups from like any amino acid can then be transferred onto glutamate, oh, sorry, transferred onto alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate. And then this glutamate can be used, um, trans transfer the nitrogen from there onto pyruvate to make um, alanine. And so you might think, okay, that's a weird, inefficient way to do things. But in this way, the enzymes, so like the proteins that are helping um, facilitate all of this, they only have to specialize in being able to like transfer it from glutamate. Um, and so if you have everything kind of like pass it on to alpha glutamate to make glutamate, then you can just focus on taking it from glutamate and putting it on pyruvate to form alanine. And then this alanine can then get transferred. Um, so it seems a little like weird and counterintuitive, but it all makes sense. And it's like this huge big net of things. Um, so yeah, so there are reasons, um, just it can get kind of confusing. And so I'm not gonna try to go too much into it, um, but basically this alanine that you then make. So now you've served the purpose of getting rid of this pyruvate um, and a nitrogen group and moving it. And so basically when you're, in order to get all that energy, you have to go, don't just be, you don't, most of the energy isn't coming from glycolysis. So you don't get that much energy from glycolysis alone. You get the energy when you're doing all this later stuff. But in order to do all this later stuff, you have to actually like do it all. And so if your muscles are like super duper busy and stuff, 
Uh, maybe there's not even enough oxygen um, because this is powered by that. So basically you don't want this pyruvate to build up. Um, and if this pyruvate's building up, it can even like put negative feedback and cause this whole process to shut down. So it's kind of like you're building up waste um, and slowing things down. And so you don't want that to happen. So you want to move that out of your muscles um, and make the liver do all the work instead. Um, and your liver can actually regenerate it. So instead of going all the way and making more energy from it, what your liver can do is it can kind of make things go backwards. So it can make like colysis go backwards and like gluconeogenesis. Um, and there are some steps it has to do slightly differently, um, but basically you can go backwards um, and through and through gluconeogenesis make glucose from that pyruvate but your muscles aren't doing that. Your liver can do that though. And so if you take the pyruvate from your muscles and bring it to the liver, then the liver can make more glucose and then send it back to the muscles, which can use the glucose. Um, so the muscles are getting a pretty good deal out of things. Um, and so, yeah, so in the liver, it's like the same type of reaction, but now it's in the other direction. So you're taking the alanine um, and now that ALT enzyme that we talked about, it's going to um, do this thing in reverse. And so it's going to take the alpha ketoglutarate and it's going to put the nitrogen, the amino group from the alanine onto that to make glutamate. Um, and then the alanine is left as pyruvate. Um, and so then that pyruvate can go be made to make sugar and the glutamate can go through the urea cycle. Um, and basically this is a way that they can get rid of this nitrogen groups as urea instead of as like ammonia and stuff. Um, so pretty cool stuff. Some more cool stuff um, are how I talked about like with chirality and stuff. So basically our bodies use the L form of amino acids, including alanine. Um, and the bacteria, they use this D form, they use the L form in like their proteins, but then they use this D form to help like strengthen their cell walls. Um, and so they actually use this like D ala, D ala, like um, cross linking um, or D ala, D ala, like these, they make these like peptide cross links with these sugar chains to make these strong walls. Um, but basically, they have this, the end of the peptide of the first peptidoglycan chain, the way that they like make these walls is that then this, um, this transpeptidase enzyme is actually going to kind of like attack. Um, and then this diala, the last diala is released. Um, and then the first chain is temporarily stuck to this transpeptidase. And then the, the um, linking part of a peptide of, this, of a second, um, one of these peptidoglycans, so these proteins attached or peptides attached to sugars, um, then it attacks and then you get those two linked together. Um, but in the intermediate, they were linked to this transpeptidase. What happens is that these beta-lactam antibiotics, they mimic the site that the transpeptidase attack, peptidase attacks. And so this is the diala diala. You can see with ampicillin, you kind of have a similar looking structure. Um, and so the transpeptidase is going to attack that, but then it can't um, get, then this basically this beta lactam, they have this beta lactam ring. So it's this really awkward, um, like awkward looking thing. And so when you attack it, it kind of breaks open and this makes it like get like permanently stuck onto here. So you can't have it like get attacked off like you saw with the Diala Diala. Um, and so this is how the ampicillin is now like, or whatever beta lactam antibiotic is now permanently stuck on the transpeptidase so then the transpeptidase can't build the walls. Um, and then the bacteria um, can't like make strong walls and then they, yeah, they die and they, can't do their stuff. Um, so like history discovery wise, um, this was from my blog. So there's more on my blog, um, but basically it's one of two protein um, amino acids that was made from scratch. So via synthesis um, before it was actually like shown to be from protein. Um, and so in 1850, Adolf Strecker um, first made and purify it. Um, and he did so not to make alanine because he didn't really know it existed. He was just trying to make lactic acid. Um, and so he made it from aldehyde ammonia. And so he gave it the name alanine um, using the first 
um, syllable of the word aldehyde. Um, for so that's why we get alanine. So like al the hide alanine and so an aldehyde is where you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen next to a hydrogen um so that's where alanine came from um and then um so as for the bragging likes for actually isolating it from a protein as opposed from just like making it um from scratch um so this was complicated so in 1875 so we're talking about 25 years later schutzenberger and bourgeois isolated it from base hydrolysis of silk, um, or at least they said so, but they didn't do any like rigorous testing of it. Um, but it seemed to be the same as that alanine um, thing that Strecker had made. Um, and then um, a few years later, this guy Schutzenberger did some more thorough analysis. Um, that original silk mix they found had a mix of stuff, so it wasn't just this alanine. Um, and so the Schutzenberger further separated it by fractional crystallization. Um, so basically, when molecules like crystallize, they like come out of solution. So like 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 a crystal, like they're the molecules are all like stuck together. It's actually like in an orderly form and there's all sorts of stuff. So they have to be like really pure when they crystallize. And so it's like be actually like a purification technique. But basically because different molecules have different solubilities and different um, solvents, they'll have like, they'll crystallize under different conditions and you can use that to like separate a mixture. Um, so we, this can be used to help like purify things. So we did this and then he measured how much carbon, nitrogen and hydrogen the various fractions had. Um, one of them was consistent with alanine, but he didn't like do tests on it. Um, so he didn't have proof that those atoms, like, so it had the right number and, of atoms and stuff, but were they connected the right way? Um, we don't know. Um, then in 1888, Theodore Wilde purified it from the hydrolysis of silk. Um, and so silk happens to be really rich in alanine. Um, and then he further characterized it and claims credit. Um, so this is not to say that any one of these people deserves more credit than any other one of them. Um, I just thought it was kind of cool history. Um, so you can learn about more about all of this and like this history of Mia paper. That's pretty cool. So I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot to love about Alanine.